Welcome to the 11th pre-recording of the Programming Languages Virtual Meetup. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in this video, we're going to be covering chapter 3.2 of the structure and interpretation of computer programs. So the table of contents for chapter 3.2 is as follows. The chapter section is entitled the environment model of evaluation, and there are four subsections, the rules for evaluation, applying simple procedures, frames as the repository of local state and internal definitions. So this chapter section is all about the environment model, which was referenced quite a bit in the previous chapter section 3.1. So early in the text of this chapter section, the text states, an environment is a sequence of frames. Each frame is a table, possibly empty, of bindings which associate variable names with their corresponding values. A single frame may contain at most one binding for any variable. Each frame also has a pointer to its enclosing environment, unless for the purposes of discussion the frame is considered to be global. The value of a variable with respect to an environment is the value given by the binding of the variable in the first frame in the environment that contains a binding for that variable. If no frame in the sequence specifies a binding for the variable, then the variable is said to be unbound in the environment. So if we have a hierarchy or sequence of frames and you are trying to find the value of a variable, you are going to basically recurse uh, or move up the ladder of frames that you're looking at until you find uh, a variable that has a binding for a value. Um, and if you can't find it, then it's unbound. So very simply, uh, here is the first figure, figure 3.1. I believe we're gonna look at all the figures because this uh, chapter does most of its uh, describing of an environment using visualizations. And note there is gonna be no code in this chapter, or at least no code in the exercises of this chapter. We'll see a bit in the text, but it's just to explain or show how this sort of maps to this visual environment. So here we have three frames. Uh, frame one, two, and three, and uh, the enclosing environment for two and three is frame one. So we've got the variables Z and X in frame two, we've got the variables M and Y in frame three, and then we've got the enclosing environment one with uh, variables X and Y, and you can see all their bindings after the colon. So if we're in frame two, for example, and we're looking for the value of X, uh, because X exists in this frame, we're going to retrieve the value 7. Um, however, uh, if we're looking for uh, Y, because Y does not exist in this frame, we'll go to the enclosing uh, frame, uh, which uh, is 1, and then we're going to look up the value of uh, Y here, which is 5. So it's pretty straightforward. Each of these sort of gray boxes represents a frame, and all of the frames together represent an environment. This uh, brings us to uh, the first subsection, the rules for evaluation. So the text states to evaluate a combination, uh, we have two steps. One, evaluate the subexpressions of the combination, and two, apply the value of the operator subexpression to the values of the opera operand subexpressions. Um, so this has been stated earlier, I believe, in chapter one. Nothing's changed. Uh, but then the text goes on to state the environment model of evaluation replaces the substitution model in specifying what it means to apply a compound procedure to arguments. Um, and then the text goes on to state, in the environment model of evaluation, a procedure is always a pair consisting of some code and a pointer to an environment. Procedures are created in one way only, by evaluating a lambda expression. This produces a procedure whose code is obtained from the text of the lambda expression and whose environment is the environment in which the lambda expression was evaluated to produce a procedure. For example, consider the procedure definition uh, the following. So we've got define square x, which is uh, uh, the multiplication of x and x. And uh, this is just syntactic sugar for the following. Define square, so note there's no parentheses around the square now, and we've got a lambda that takes a single parameter x, and then the body is the same uh, that we saw in the first definition. So these two are equivalent. So when it says on the previous slide here that uh, the only way to create a procedure is by evaluating a lambda expression, don't be confused because we haven't been explicitly stating lambda when we define procedures. That's just because this syntax is uh, syntax sugar for the following, which does explain explicitly have a lambda. So if we go on to the next figure, which is figure 3.2, this is the visualization of the environment for when we evaluate uh, this define procedure here. Uh, when we evaluate this, it is going to define uh, a procedure which points to the following. So anytime you see these two dots, uh, that's what it was referring to as sort of the two pieces here. Um, We've got the piece that contains the parameters and the body of the procedure, and then we've got an arrow pointing back to the enclosing environment. So 
Uh, I believe here I've, I've color-coded these. The red one is the piece that is pointing to the parameters in the body of the procedure. Uh, the blue one is the one that's pointing back to the enclosing environment. So um, this is very simple, and these are going to get more complicated as we go on. So the next one, I believe, is if we uh, evaluate uh, a square when we pass it an argument. Um, and that argument is 5. So you can see here, all we've done is we have added an extra frame uh, and this is going to bind uh, the value 5 to the parameter x and then when this is evaluated we're going to end up with 25 and the enclosing environment for this uh, frame is going to be the global environment. Um, so we will move on so this is figure 3.3 and uh, read what the text says next which is the environment model of procedure application can be summarized by two rules the first one a procedure object is applied to a set of arguments by constructing a frame binding the formal parameters of the procedure to the arguments of the call and then evaluating the body of the procedure in the context of the new environment constructed the new frame has as its enclosing environment the environment part of the procedure object being applied and the part two is a procedure is created by evaluating a lambda expression relative to a given environment. The resulting procedure object is a pair consisting of the text of the lambda expression, which makes is made up of the uh, parameters and the body, and a pointer to the environment in which the procedure was created. So uh, it's a bit confusing that they stated them in this order because the first one point here is sort of referring uh, to what we saw in figure 3.3, uh, evaluating square five. And the second point is referring back to what we saw in figure 3.2. Um, so uh, a bit odd that they introduce the second point first and the first point second. Uh, but these are the two um, pieces of procedure application that you need to know uh, within the environment model. And I believe this brings us to our second subsection, 3.2.2, uh, applying simple procedures. So this is just going to be a more... Uh, complicated version of what we just saw. So here we have uh, three different uh, procedures. We've got square x, uh, sum of squares, and f. And if you recall, this actually comes from one of the uh, earlier chapters, sections in chapter one. Um, and so if we look at the visualization of this, now we have uh, three different procedures in our global environment that uh, are each made up of the parameters in the body of the uh, corresponding uh, definitions that we saw. And then we move to figure 3.5, and this is a bit irritating. I know it's a textbook, so they can only fit so much on one page, but um, you should think of this similar to the previous example that we saw in 3.2, figure 3.2 and figure 3.3. So all of these frames here are really right next to what we just saw in 3.4. So this is all the same example. I guess they just couldn't fit it all um, on sort of one page. And so similar to what we saw before when we were evaluating square with the value 5, uh, we are now evaluating f with the value 5. Um, and then f is going to call sum of squares. Sum of squares is going to call square twice. And so you can see each of these frames here, this one maps to sum of squares. This one maps to uh, the, or sorry, this one maps to f, which calls sum of squares. This one maps to sum of squares, which calls square twice. And these two map to square. Um, and all of these have the uh, bindings uh, of the correct values for the parameters listed for each of the procedures. And this brings us to our first exercise, uh, exercise 3.9, which reads as following. In section 1.2.1, we use the substitution model to analyze two procedures for computing factorials. A recursive version, which is the following. So factorial n, it's got an if expression. If n is equal to 1, that's our base case, return 1. Otherwise, multiply n times factorial of n minus 1. And an iterative version. I'm not going to read through this. We've seen it before, but note it's not uh, recursive. It is using uh, not necessarily an interme intermediate iterative function, or it is an intermediate iter iterative function, but it's not uh, defined within factorial. It's defined as its own standalone function or procedure, I should say. Uh, so then the, the question of exercise 3.9 is show the environment structure created by evaluating factorial 6 using each version of the factorial procedure. So both the recursive and iterative. Um, so this is a colorful version of what we've seen previously. So here is our global environment frame. Uh, we've got one procedure in here, factorial, after 
uh, evaluating the defined factorial for the recursive version. And note here, our red uh, circle, which is one piece of our procedure, is made up of the parameters, which is just n, and then the body, and then the blue piece points back to the enclosing environment. And once we evaluate factorial with a value of 6, we get the following. So each of the recursive calls, so our initial call to factorial 6, is going to create another call uh, with a different value. So we're going to end up with uh, n equal to 5 for the subsequent call, all the way down to n equals 1. So there's going to be 6 frames created, and at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a uh, factorial of 6 being equal to... I believe uh, 720. Um, so unlike a couple of the previous examples in the textbook where they sort of split these onto two different figures, this is how it looks. The procedure and all the frames from evaluating uh, those procedures with uh, uh, arguments um, are all in the same environment. Um, so that is just good to note, which cannot be, it might not be explicitly clear from reading the book. This brings us to our iterative solution to the factorial function. So note this is slightly different. As I mentioned before, the intermediate iterative function, fact iter, is a standalone function. So in our global environment, we have two different procedures, factorial and the intermediate iterative function, fact iter. And if we kick this off by calling factorial 6, we'll end up with the following frames. So the first one uh, is going to be uh, a call to the factorial function. And then this is going to kick off a number of calls to our fact iter function. So you can see that our only parameter in our factorial function is n equal to 6. But the subsequent calls to the fact iter function, or procedure I should say, um, have uh, changing arguments. So our accumulator starts off as 1, and then this is going to accumulate up to 720, the value of 6 factorial. Our counter, which is being used to check if we've hit our base condition of where uh, the number of times we've called this function, is greater than our max. Um, which at that point will return our accumulated value, and then max is consistently staying the same at 6. Um, so this is a bit more informative than the uh, previous examples that we saw, so hopefully at this point it's starting to make sense. We have procedures that exist in our frames or environments, and then we have frames that exist within those frames. So it's as the beginning of the chapter section said, we have a sequence of frames and then procedures uh, that consists of two pieces, the parameters and body, and then a arrow pointing to the enclosing environment. This takes us to the third subsection, frames as the repository of local state. At this point, it shows us another example that we've seen before in previous chapters, which is the make withdraw uh, procedure used to store a certain balance, and then we have an amount that we can pass to this uh, procedure that's going to be returned. Um, in order to adjust the balance, so take out funds, basically. Um, and here we have our figure 3.6, which is showing uh, what this environment looks like. So we've got our global environment once again, then we have a procedure, make withdraw, and different sort of than what we've seen before, our parameters, it's a balance, but then the body uh, is a lambda itself. So um, when we invoke this, it's going to do something slightly different than we've seen before. So uh, once again, though, the first uh, piece of our procedure pointing to the parameters in the body, the second piece pointing to the enclosing environment. If we uh, invoke the following, so we end up with uh, w1 being the result of evaluating make, make withdraw 100, we end up with the following. So this is a Initially, when I saw this, I was a bit confused, but the key thing to note is that make withdraw has slid sort of to the right. So this is not the same um, code or not the same piece of the diagram that we saw uh, two slides ago. So this here has slid over to the right, and what we're seeing on the left is something new. So make withdraw, if you pay close attention, has shifted up, and then there's an arrow pointing down, and then we just have a dot, dot, dot. So this is different. This W1 is the result of having uh, evaluated uh, the following. So uh, we now have an arrow pointing to a procedure. And at this point, we no longer see the lambda. And we see what was inside the lambda because we've now evaluated that lambda expression, which is in line with what this uh, chapter has been explaining to us. The result of a procedure in an environment is the result of evaluating a lambda expression. So the lambda has disappeared here. We now have the body of that lambda, which is sort of the contents of uh, what we would expect to see in a, a procedure. Uh, we're no longer taking a balance, we're taking an amount, which was the previous parameter of the lambda. And uh, this, the, in, 
frame or the environment that this exists in is not the global environment now. It is uh, the frame or the environment created from evaluating that a lambda expression, which now contains this uh, variable balance that is currently bound to 100. And this is contained within the um, global environment. So in the global environment, we have our uh, procedure make withdraw, and we now have W1 as well. And I believe the next slide uh, is going to show us what happens if we now evaluate W150. Well, this is in the interim going to uh, set up a frame that is enclosed within E1, which was created from evaluating uh, the W1 make withdraw 100 originally. Uh, this is going to uh, work its way through this procedure because 50 is. Um, uh, less than the balance, it is going to be able to take that money out, and then we're going to end up with the following. So this is sort of like an intermediate uh, state of our environment, and once we've finished finished evaluating that expression, we're going to end up with what we saw before. So note, it's, it's very irritating because we've seen, what, 3.7, 3.8, and 3.9, and the way that they shift these around is very confusing, and 3.6, I guess. So we start off with 3.6, we have make withdraw, they shift make withdraw to the right and then have the contents of W1 here. Then in 3.8, uh, this is sort of an intermediate state that's going to disappear. And then in 3.9, they just put dot, dot, dot. They don't even bother showing uh, the arrow. Um, I guess they're just trying to highlight what's changed here. But I would prefer a more consistent diagram where just by visually looking at it, you can clearly see the delta. Um, you sort of really have to pay attention to what are they leaving out with the uh, dot dot dots and um, how these arrows sort of push things around. Anyways, hopefully that makes sense having been walked through it. Um, and they've got a final diagram, uh, which, or this isn't the final one, I believe it's the second last one, which shows what happens if we create W2 using the same uh, make withdraw 100 that we saw before. Well, now we just basically have the same thing. So once again, make withdraw dot dot dot. They're not showing anything for that. W1, this is what we saw before, and it currently has a balance of 100. Uh, uh, currently has a balance of 50, but W2 is starting from um, the same place. And here, what they've shown is that uh, this is sort of implementation dependent. Um, you can have the parameters and the body each pointing to separate ones, or you can uh, have them point to the same one in order to save on space. So here they're pointing to the same one and because we haven't uh, done anything, the balance is just equal to 100. This takes us to our final exercise, exercise 3.10, which states in the make withdraw procedure, the local variable balance is created as a parameter of make withdraw. We could also create the local state variable explicitly using a let expression as follows. So we no longer have balance as our initial parameter, we have initial amount, and then we are setting balance in a let expression equal to initial amount, and then we have uh, lambda similar to what we've seen before. Recall from section 1.3.2 that a let expression is simply syntactic sugar for a procedure call. So if we have a let expression that follows the following pattern, uh, this is equivalent to a lambda expression uh, with the following pattern. Uh, the question then goes on to state, use the environment model to analyze this alternate version of make withdraw, drawing figures like the ones above to illustrate the interactions. So if we have defined W1, make withdraw 100, W150, and W2, make withdraw 100 like we have before, uh, you know, make up those diagrams to show uh, how it compares. So I'm not going to show the W2. I'm just going to take, I believe it's either figure 3.6 or 3.7, and show how it differs. So here we have make withdraw and W1 are two procedures. And then uh, we have uh, the enclosing environment of our procedure for W1 uh, being E1, this frame that has a uh, variable balance set to 100. And if we use this definition where we have a let expression, we're basically going to be adding an extra level in here. So uh, instead of the frame E1 being contained uh, in our global environment, um, it's now renamed to E2 and contained in the frame, the new frame E1, uh, which has initial amount set to 100. And note, this is not going to change. Um, if we look at our uh, definition of make withdraw here, we use initial amount to set balance, but then we don't refer to it ever again. So it's going to always be uh, 100 or whatever you set it to. And if we also compare our two procedures, you'll note that um, our make withdraw initially took a balance. Now it takes initial amount and our uh, w1 used to take a parameter called amount it now takes a parameter called balance and returns a uh, lambda uh, that has a parameter called amount other than that it looks 
somewhat similar. And all of the rules that we've seen before um, are going to hold for sort of evaluating uh, evaluating these procedures when uh, they are passed variables. So when intermediate frames are created and then used to reset uh, the value of balance. And this brings us to our final subsection 3.2.4 internal definitions where we're going to look at a final example. So in this example we have our square root iterative procedure uh, that makes calls to the intermediate iteration function square root iter. Uh, but in total there are sort of three internally defined procedures within square root. Um, so we saw this earlier in chapter one I believe. And now we're going to be looking at what uh, the corresponding environment looks like for this procedure. So as expected, we have only one procedure in our global environment, that's square root. So the second uh, dot here points back to square root or points back to the global environment. And then the first dot points to the parameters, which is X, and then our body, which consists of the following four expressions. Uh, then when we make a call to square root, we are setting up a, another frame, which is called E1. Uh, the first three expressions when evaluated are going to basically give us our procedures good enough, improve, and square root iter. And then on the final uh, expression of our body, we're going to be making a call to square root iter. So this is going to set up our next frame, E2, and all of the subsequent frames uh, that are uh, set up are going to be enclosed within E1. Um, so that's basically what this final subsection is highlighting is that when we have either this sort of square root uh, uh, procedure that is using internally defined procedures or if we're using sort of the message passing style that was uh, uh, taught or demonstrated at the end of chapter two, we end up with sort of a frame that's enclosed within our global environment and then all of the subsequent frames used to do any calculations within uh, this are going to be enclosed within that frame, so it being E1. So we kick off um, square root iter. If we take a look, and so then our initial value is 1 for guess. If we take a look at square root iter, uh, what is it doing here? Uh, in our if expression, the first thing it does is make a call to good enough. So sure enough, uh, the next frame, E3, which is also enclosed within E1, is making a call to good enough with uh, the value for guess being 1. And then it's going to continue to make calls and set up frames until we end up satisfying uh, the predicate or the tolerance that's been established in our good enough procedure. So that's basically what this last section is highlighting. And the last thing that the text states that I thought was worth pointing out is the following, uh, which says, the environment model thus explains the two key properties that make local procedure definitions a useful technique for modular modularizing programs. Number one, the names of local procedures do not interfere with names external to the enclosing procedure because the local procedure names will be bound in that frame that the procedure creates when it is run rather than being bound in the global environment. And two, the local procedures can access the arguments of the enclosing procedure simply by using parameter names as free variables. This is because the body of the local procedure is evaluated in an environment that is subordinate to the evaluation environment for the enclosing procedure. So that's that for chapter section 3.2, all about the environment model. Um, I don't have anything to show from the lectures. Uh, one, because the MIT lecture uh, for this uh, chapter section was the same as the video we watched last week. And the Berkeley lectures, uh, they were taught by some of the TAs and were um, pretty overwhelming, in my opinion. So I didn't think that there was anything worth highlighting. Um, that being said, hopefully you enjoyed this uh, shorter chapter. It's the shortest chapter that we've covered so far. It's the third shortest in the book, so there are two more shorter chapters to come. Um, that's it for chapter 3.2. As I mentioned before, I hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something, and I hope to see you next week. Have a great day.